On April 17, 2839, Konrad Toyama, Primus of Comstar, suffered a fatal stroke. He passed away that same day. His body was cremated and his ashes were entombed within the ruins of Unity City on Terra. Toyama's death severed one of the very last links to the old Star League. By war's end, there would be none alive who still remembered life during humanity's golden age. Shortly before his passing, Raymond Karpov, presenter Alpha Centauri and member of the First Circuit, had been named Toyama's successor. The proximity of this announcement to the Primus's death have naturally led many to speculate the two were connected. Similar rumours had perpetuated following Conrad's takeover after Blake's demise. There is no way to know for certain if Raymond had a hand in his mentor's death, but there was a possible motive. Comstar records show that the First Circuit was increasingly concerned that the successor states were losing confidence in their neutrality following the Shadow War with the Free Wells League. Though Captain General Charles Maddock had withdrawn the accusations that he had been double-crossed, the suggestion that they could not be trusted lingered, and it clung to Toyama most. Karpov perhaps felt that removing the Primus was the only way to ensure that the organization did not continue to slide backwards. For Raymond Karpov, Comstar truly was a sacred order. Any history of the era frequently describes him as a fanatic, a true believer in the word of Blake. Toyama may have instituted the changes in doctrine that his master requested in order to reform it into a pseudo-religion, but it was the new Primus that really cemented it as a theocratic institution. His first move was to name Conrad a saint, placing him up on a pedestal alongside the Blessed Founder. But he went much further. Henceforth, all members of the Comstar Order were to wear robes adorned with symbols relating to mathematics, theoretical physics, or mechanical principles. They were to perform chants and incantations before operating the sacred hyperpulse generators, or any machinery considered suitably holy. Karpov's changes would ironically bring about the cognitive atrophy that Blake had envisioned within the very society who was supposed to safeguard that knowledge. Of course, those on Terra hoarded that information and technical understanding for themselves, but the adepts and even presenters of foreign realms comprehended the technology around them less and less with each passing year. This proved an effective safeguard against any of the successor states trying to subvert their operations. These radical changes did not go unchallenged. Two members of the First Circuit walked out in protest, but this only allowed Karpov to replace them with loyal stooges. It was Organizational Edict 3056 which caused the biggest stir within Comstar. ROM was to be expanded from an internal security agency to a militant branch of the Order tasked with hunting down and killing any individual whose work might halt the technological decline of the successor states. Presenter Rom Michel Dupree was outraged by the change in our organization's mandate. She would not back down, and ended up resigning within 24 hours of the edict coming into effect. Her replacement, Janice Laidlaw, saw to it that Dupree would suffer a fatal traffic accident five days later. With his opposition removed and the loyal Laidlaw at his side, Primus Raymond Karpov ordered the commencement of Operation Holy Shroud. A list of targeted institutions and individuals were dispatched to ROM teams across the Inner Sphere for them to eliminate. Universities were frequent targets of sabotage or even bombings. More specific examples include FTL communication research in the Federated Suns, and Leiden Commonwealth efforts to recover ferrofibrous technology, both of which were completely destroyed by ROM. The Comstar War had necessitated the Free Wells League launching their own HPG projects. Any and all information pertaining to this was eradicated by Karpov's fanatics. The First Succession War had resulted in the disappearance of many of the Star League's most advanced technologies from the Inner Sphere. These were subsequently dubbed Lost Tech, and functional examples in the modern era are exceedingly rare, 
if not altogether extinct. The Second Succession War had already seen even moderately sophisticated computer equipment drop out of use. Laidlaw's efforts saw this trend continue. The raids were undertaken with the utmost caution to ensure that they could not be traced back to Comstar. With war raging on every front, it wasn't difficult to pin the blame on their neighbouring successor states or internal extremist groups. Another of the casualties was the compact Kearney Fushida Drive, the advanced jump cores around which warships were built. By this point, there were at most two dozen such vessels still in service, but the destruction of the few shipyards sufficiently sophisticated enough to maintain them, and the wholesale murder of those engineers who possessed the knowledge to construct them, guaranteed that warships would soon vanish into the history books. ROM's actions were not limited to military technology either. Commercial, industrial and medical sectors had already been badly affected by the wars, as academics were conscripted for military projects. Holy Shroud had no qualms about continuing their decline, hitting them just as hard. Countless thousands, if not millions, have died in the centuries since that might have been saved had the Precentor and her Primus not been so thorough in their reversal of human advancement. One of Rom's more secretive objectives was to hunt for and recover any lost SLDF caches. These pre-war installations contained not just military materiel, but a wealth of knowledge that might be used to halt the technological nosedive. Whenever an installation was uncovered, Comstar would relocate the weapons within to their vast warehouses on Terra, and either hoard or destroy the computer archives as appropriate. People today in 3025 often speculate on what effect uncovering a functional memory core would have on the war-torn successor states. Operation Holy Shroud would run until 2845. During that time, Comstar successfully assassinated more than 300 of the best scientific minds in the Inner Sphere. Professors, teachers and researchers that would be sorely missed in the coming years. Comstar's systematic dismantling of advanced technology was going on behind the scenes while the successor states were still duking it out along every front. The Freewells League had been on the back foot for the past two years and would struggle to turn their fortunes around. Thankfully, they did not exist in isolation, and aggression on the part of more distant realms into the exposed flanks of their more immediate neighbours would stem the flow of forces pouring into Matic territory. First to come under assault from an unexpected aggressor had been the Lyran Commonwealth. In a repeat of events following the Second Battle of Hesperus, the armed forces of the Federated Sons had raided Steiner systems around Terra. New Earth and Men Kent were hit back in December 2838, then Summer, Thorin and Miser in March. Some minor payback would come in the spring, when the LCAF landed on Castor and Alfard, both of which were currently being ransacked by the AFFS and DCMS respectively. The two systems would submit to Leiden rule soon after. Three other nearby systems were also seized by House Steiner. Further along the border, another turncoat mercenary group took the planet Rexburg over to the Commonwealth. The LCAF focus in that region was on Tamarind. They began their assault in April, but came up against stiff opposition within the capital Paderon City, the so-called Venice of Tamarind. The layout of the canals served as a series of bottlenecks the defenders took full advantage of. Steiner abandoned their efforts on May 11th, and instead began preparing for new offensives elsewhere. Liao was also facing aggression from their far side that would prevent them from making as much progress into the crumbling Freewells League as they might have liked. Leading these raids were the recently expanded 4th Certis Fusiliers. After the marriage of Damien Hassock and Margaret Ross the previous June, the veterans of her bloody sons had been folded into the unit, bringing it back up to full strength. 
most of the five targets Davian was going after were already considered too far gone to be worth putting up a fight over, and so they cut their losses rather than divert troops away from their primary objective. Capellan actions that year were focused around the Duchy of Andurian. Successful attacks against Karlstein and Katla kept nearby forces pinned down while they made another attempt to crack Andurian. This was the fourth successive attack in 18 months, and the defences were severely compromised. Despite this, they wouldn't give an inch, and managed to hold their ground until reinforcements arrived in August, turning the tables in their favour. Liao withdrew two months later. Despite dealing with the Comstar problem, Charles Maddock still found no peace at home, as Minister of Finance Hector Lombard persisted in his efforts to withhold funding for the FWLM. He demanded that Resolution 288 be repealed, and the Free Wells League return to a more democratic system of government. The Captain General finally cracked in August 2839. He dispatched his personal guard to arrest Lombard and his allies, in flagrant violation of the Articles of Unification that had formed the League back in 2271. Unfortunately for Maddock, Lombard's faction were able to escape the trap, and fled to Helos Minor, where they set up a parliament in exile. Charles's heavy-handed approach had destroyed the last of his support within government. He was now completely alone, facing an imminent defeat. Despite the odds against him, Maddock was not prepared to go quietly into the night. Early in 2840, he launched counterattacks against Graham and Oliver, with supporting raids into the Federation of Sky. A stroke of good fortune won him an easy victory on Graham IV, when in late February, the Lyran commander Colonel Hendrik Grimm snapped under the pressure of having to defend this critical staging post with so little forces available to him. Grimm and his unit went AWOL, and began making for the periphery, picking up the survivors of another Lyran regiment along the way. Together, they raided storehouses on both sides of the border. Both the Freewells and Lyrans would place a bounty on them for their actions. The FWLM attack on Oliver was also a success for Maddock, taking the planet back in mid-March. Maintaining the momentum, the Freewells League military struck at Zosma, Denebola, and New Earth. These attacks kept the LCAF from advancing in that region, though they were still able to seize Concord and Promised Land further along the border. The last of the Capellan advances also came in 2840, though these won them precious little in the way of territory. The defenders on New Delos held their ground when the CCAF arrived in March, though another raid on Andurian in the summer did succeed in damaging their mech production plants. Their final effort came at Ascension in August, a system that Maddock had been stubbornly clinging to despite its position far beyond the borders of its realm. While they may have been able to take back control of the planet, the Capellan armed forces had overextended themselves in doing so. Trying to take advantage of the situation while they were still overwhelmed, Charles used the only fresh levies he had been able to secure funding for to launch raids on Berenson and Fact in late October. Unfortunately, the Green Troops would not survive their first engagement, a punishing loss for a military that was struggling to stay afloat. Despite the lacklustre result, Liao was spent. Trying to maintain order on the dozens of worlds they had claimed these past few years consumed all their energy. With no ability to push any further in either direction, Lorelli Liao was forced to accept that recovering Chesterton was no longer a possibility. The Chesterton Decree granted House Hargreaves a seat on the Prefectorate as Duke in Exile, but they would likely never recover their ancestral home. Yoguchi Kurita had spent his first years as coordinator revitalizing the DCMS and expanding their mercenary roster with Leviathan's Wake. As a career soldier, he did not wish to give up on a chance to lead troops into battle, and so in 2840 he reformed the fourth Sword of Light out of the battered remnants of the Eighth. Going forwards, these would serve as his family's personal guard. 
Though Yaguchi's actions so far had appeased the mustard soldiery, he did make one critical mistake. Never a strong supporter of the ISF, who he either didn't trust or considered dishonourable, early in his reign he placed the entire internal security force under the command of the military. This caused quite an upset within both factions. The DCMS felt they were being spied on, whereas the ISF felt they were being unfairly slighted after loyally serving the coordinator for many generations. It was a fracture that others would seek to exploit. Kurita's revitalised DCMS began moving across the Lyran border in April. A pair of thrusts pushed into both the Federation of Sky and Tamar Pact. Along the periphery border, the largest DCMS task force tried to mislead Steiner as to which planet they were heading towards by jumping from Verthandi to Chateau and then back to New Caledonia in May. First down were a battalion of the Sword of Light, who smartly made the capture of the planet's major supply and distribution hub their first objective. Once the spaceport was secured, the rest of the regiments entered atmosphere. Leading the Combine assault was the coordinator's son, Taisho Hugai Kurita, at the head of his father's regiment. Opposing him was Colonel Tiber Hinders of the Royal Guard, though their units would not be involved in the initial clashes. A diversionary raid was staged on Harvest, an agricultural linchpin of the region. The Razalheg regulars met with such success that they ended up calling in reinforcements to help them secure the system. Less than 20% of the York regulars were able to escape Harvest, the survivors later disbanded. Back at the New Caledonian capital, the Royal Guards were fighting tooth and nail to hold back the DCMS. But once the Sword of Light overcame the York regulars, the odds of holding the city looked slim. Tiber's brother, Michael Hinders, broke off one of the battalions to prevent the Curitans from being able to bring their full might to bear. But by late August, they were in retreat yet again, this time heading to the SLDF fortress known as Red Castle. It would take another 17 months to drive them out. The Lambrecht salient was one Kurita was eager to remove. With the swift nullification of the garrison's air power, the aforementioned world became the first to fall after just three weeks. Thorin was the complete inverse. Terrible storms downed more aerospace fighters than either side's pilots. The reduced visibility they brought with them aided the heavier Lyran mechs and hindered the lighter Combine ones. When they did stumble into each other, the LCAF invariably came out on top. The Curitan commander cut their losses, just as his Steiner counterpart on Lambrecht was doing the same. Deeper inside the Federation at Rancher, a raid on the Caledonia system resulted in the destruction of the last Mako-class corvette. It's unclear how many warships were still in existence at this point, but the only vessel in the Lyra navy we know of was the LCS Invincible. By the end of the decade, it too would be put out to pasture when it was relocated to the capital Tharkad and decommissioned. The renewed conflict along their Spinwood border heavily disrupted Steiner's planned 2841 offensive against the Free Wills League. Action around Tamarind had already dropped off, with the FWLM reclaiming four of their lost systems at the expense of only Kavanagh. The Lyrans also took Danae back in February, but after this their focus was to shift towards the Marek Commonwealth. To lead their attack in the region, they had managed to secure a contract with the 12th Starguard, who had served with the Capellans throughout the Succession Wars up to that point. Their summer assaults began with Savannah, Remulac and Nathan, but long before they were secured in autumn, the Curitan threat had emerged along Steiner's flank, preventing any further advances. On the Draconis Combine home front, Yoguchi Kurita's sister Rowena was named the coordinator of the People's Reconstruction Effort in 2841, a post previously held by their father. Women in the Draconis Combine were frequent victims of discrimination in professional circles, especially within the military and government. While service was not discouraged among the lower classes, noblewomen had a very rigidly defined role at their husband's or father's side. It was very much a man's world. 
But the PRE, as a distinctly non-military organisation, was not seen as being beyond her station as a woman. The position came with vast resources that Rowena immediately put to work, creating a second bureaucracy loyal exclusively to her. Within a year of this, she was making connections within the disenfranchised ISF, ultimately leading to a relationship with director Malcolm Katsuyori. She opened the PRE to his organisation, improving its efficiency while giving her allies a new avenue of gathering intelligence. They in turn provided her with information she used to increase her private wealth substantially. Her aggrandizement was not perceived as a direct challenge to her older brother, since it seemed to focus solely around material gain. By all accounts, the two siblings shared a strong familial bond, and so no effort was taken to curb her activities. Yoguchi Kurita had also ordered a pair of assaults against the Federated Sons in 2841, one each against the Robinson and Woodbine operational areas. The Davian realm had been largely quiet for the past few years, busy incorporating so many conquered Capellan systems into their realm. The military had not been idle, however, long suspecting that another Kuritan attack would come. The assault came later than it otherwise might have done, as on July 11th, the former coordinator Jinjiro Kurita in his secluded cell hanged himself. A week of mourning delayed operations but they began immediately after. Early success was made by those units participating in the Robinson Thrust, capturing Breed, Clathandu, and Royal. But the raid against the capital was an abject failure. Running into far stiffer resistance than anticipated, the DCMS withdrew after just six days. Towards the Outworlds, Kulia became the first but ultimately only planet to change hands. Attacks on Anguilla, Bremond, and Sturgis went nowhere, while the garrison at their primary objective, Tancredi IV, proved as intractable as those on Robinson. After 11 days stuck in urban combat, the Curitan survivors withdrew. On their way out of the system, they unleashed a bioweapon that would render this vital agricultural system virtually inhospitable. The Davian counterattack came sooner than the Draconis Combine could have imagined. In late October, they made their first moves in what would become their primary war aim for the next few years, re-establishing a Terran corridor. An invasion of four Kuritan planets followed. Naturally, the DCMS redeployed to deal with this new threat, but this opened them up to other intrusions along a much neglected front. Chancellor Lorelli Liao ordered her troops to advance into Curitan space, taking for herself Anka, Keen, New Florence, Ronal, and Tybalt, all of which the dragon had pried away from them early in the 29th century. This threw Davian plans into disarray, as those were systems that they too coveted. Assembling a large task force, they decided to strike instead at one of the Confederation's cornerstones, the planet Northwind. Four mech regiments arrived in November, escorted by a pair of warships. Three lighter Capellan vessels opposed them, but the loss of CCS Major caused the other two indispensable warships to withdraw. The way had been cleared. Though the Northwind Highlanders fielded an unmatched six regiments, only two were ever home at one time. The rest were sorely needed elsewhere. Most of the fighting would take place within the Cairngorm Mountains, while the Blue Star Irregulars moved to take control of Cromarty City. The canyons allowed the Highlanders to mitigate their numbers' disadvantage, but as the AFFS closed relentlessly, they realized that neither did the canyons allow for a way out. Both regiments were destroyed utterly, fighting to the bitter end. Capellan propaganda cast the Davian invaders as barbarians, and soon the rest of the mercenary brigade were calling for retribution. Lorelli denied them, however, unable to spare such a powerful frontline unit for a non-essential objective, though she promised them that one day the Northwind Highlanders would return home. Davian completed their conquest of Mallory's world and Ozawa, then secured Mara and New Roads in the new year. Further spinward, they had equal success. 
The AWFS worked alongside the new War Griffins mercenary carder to take Briceland, Medrin, Niles and Whittington. But these were the only planets to change hands on this front in 2842. In the Freewells League, Charles Maddock could feel the noose tightening around his neck. In the past few months, Liao had taken Procyon and Steiner a further five systems. A despairing Captain General was heading for what he believed would be the final battle of his time in office. Charles had become persona non grata within his own parliament on Atreus, and so took what ragtag forces he could muster to the hyper-industrial world of Irian for a hopeless defence. He was reinforced by Harlan Allison at the head of his premier Fusiliers of Oriente brigade, but the odds of turning back the approaching Lyran onslaught seemed slim. Harlan too was resigned to his fate. He had lost both his sons during the Comstar War, an only daughter to a tragic accident. He seemed content to go out fighting alongside his lord and master. Judgment Day arrived on January 5th. Despite being outnumbered 3 to 1, Marek and Allison held their ground around the Irian Technologies headquarters and factory. Battle mechs, fresh off the assembly lines, were pressed into service only to be destroyed hours later. It was a brutal affair, with all the worst hallmarks of urban warfare. Kirin River, the planetary capital, was surrounded by a massive 20 meter wall, with another around Old Town at its centre. Steiner breached the outer defences early, meaning the two sides were penned in between the fortifications. On February 9th, the Captain General was ambushed and his Orion mech destroyed. He ejected moments before detonation and was recovered by reserves before he could be captured. This was small comfort to him, as the Lyrans had established a beachhead within Old Town. The day before the battle commenced, an important development had occurred back on Atreus. The Duke of Oriente had sent his brother Kendall to meet with one of the few Maddox loyalists remaining, Marin Ladislaw. Also lending his support to what would become known as the Ladislaw Amendment was Duke Jonathan Humphreys. By this point, Hector Lombard's coalition had collapsed into bickering among themselves, meaning there was no united opposition to the bill that would restore military funding and raise fresh levies to relieve the FWLM on Irian. Facing the very real prospect that the Freewells League was about to be overrun, many MPs turned back to Marek. Voting on the crucial legislation concluded with a tally of 213 for to 185 against. Help was on the way. It arrived just as the Lyrans were about to land the killing blow. On March 19th, five regiments appeared in system aboard hastily chartered merchant freighters and headed for the Captain General. Their initial ferocity helped them win the Battle of Kirin River, but Steiner still controlled the rest of the planet. The Lyrans were suffering from heavy attrition, but the FWLM reinforcements were poorly organised and inexperienced. However, when word reached them that other liberation efforts had reclaimed Bonaire and Tania Borealis and were now heading that way, the Archon realised that Irian was a lost cause and ordered the survivors to pull back. This was the turning point. Charles Maddock and the Freewells League had survived their darkest hour. They would soon remind their aggressors that the Eagle United was a force to be reckoned with. Well, this ended up being quite a long one then. We're getting back towards the length of the first Succession War series. I did try to keep them a little bit shorter this time round, but there was a lot to go through. I know Operation Holy Shroud goes on for another few years after the end of this one, but uh, since it's kind of detached from everything else that is going on, I thought it was possible to cover it all at the beginning of this one. It's interesting that so much of the imagery we associate with Comstar, the robes and the religious trappings, don't actually exist for the first 50 years of its existence. They came about very suddenly with the rise of Raymond Karpov. Because I focus so much on them in this episode, 
and really they're only just continuing that Operation Holy Shroud in the background for the next few years. Uh, I don't think they'll get mentioned again for a little while, maybe come back a, a bit later on in the uh, 2850s. But just know that they're always conducting some minor operation or other to try and undermine the successor states, keep them at each other's throat, prolong the conflict, and drive down their uh, technological capabilities. I mentioned that this was quite a long chapter, but it's actually the next one which is going to be the longest of this series, unless I redivide up how I cover it. It'll continue forwards from this turning point at Irian, right the way through to the end of 2849, to the rest of this decade. Things are getting a lot more political now, which I really like, and that's going to continue on in the next chapter in just about every nation, the Free Wells League, the Lyran Commonwealth, the Federated Sons, and especially the Draconis Combine. Uh, there's a lot going on behind the scenes. The fighting's not going to stop either, of course, and the, the, especially the Free Wells League's effort to try and reclaim some of its lost territory. They're going to be pushing back hard. If you've enjoyed today's video and you want to help support the channel, you can leave me a like or leave me a comment below. Both of those help with the algorithm. I read every comment and try to respond to as many as I can. Sharing the video around helps more than just about anything else. It's a big boost in YouTube's eyes and it's always helpful for me to gain more audience. I also have a Patreon linked in the description below. If you want to see episodes before they release here on YouTube, you can see where things go next uh, ahead of time. Thank you very much for watching and I hope to see you again next time.